The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to Second Church on this third Sunday of Easter. Called and gathered by God, we continue to prepare our hearts and minds for worship using the introit found in your bulletin. Join me in our responsive call to worship. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Christ is the light of the world. The light of the darkness Christ is the living word. Christ is the living water. Christ is the great table host. Our gathering hymn is number 204. Christ is risen. Shout Hosanna.
of God, grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance from the one who is, who was, and who ever shall be. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. The one who calls us to repent hears us when we cry out. In trust that our Creator knows us through and through, let us open our hearts to the healing of God's forgiveness. Please join me in our prayer of confession. God, our Redeemer, in raising Jesus from the dead, you showed us your power to defeat all that brings fear and sorrow to our lives. Yet we confess we are sometimes uncertain if we can trust the promise of resurrection for ourselves. Forgive us when we struggle to trust your goodness for us. Forgive us when we miss the signs of Lord have, mercy. Lord, have mercy. In 1 John 3, we hear, See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Out of God's abundant love for his children, we are forgiven and freed from sin. As forgiven and freed people, we are called to live as people of love, grace, and mercy. May we strive to be such people following the way of Christ. The peace of the risen Christ be with you. Please share a sign of Christ's peace with those around you. Love to invite any children to come and join me up front, if they would. All right, well, let's get ready by singing our Alleluia song together. Thank you for helping us sing that good hallelujah song. Alita asked me why sometimes we say alleluia and sometimes we say hallelujah. I don't really know. I think it's just two different ways to spell the word. What do you think? Is it true? Maybe? Who knows? Um, what season is it? The season after Easter? Mmm, not quite. It's it has Easter in its name. It's Easter Tide. Hmm, are we doing our laundry in some Tide soap? No, <laughs> Easter Tide. It's a season. Is it long or short? 
What? It's long, longer than Lent. Ooh, longer than 40 days, because Lent is 40 days. Remember, we did math last week. 10 more days. 50. Yep, 50 days of Easter. And that includes Sundays, whereas Lent doesn't include Sundays. I don't know why they do this funny math on our calendars for liturgical year, but that's what they do. 50 days to celebrate Easter, 50 days to sing our alleluias, hallelujahs, however you want to spell it or say it or sing it. So do you think that this is a happy season or a sad season? A happy season. Mm -hmm. Is it a getting ready season? Yep. Not really. No, nope. usually our purple seasons are kind of our getting ready seasons. Do you think it's a growing season like our green season? Hmm. No, you don't think so? Are you going to grow? Do you ever stop growing? No. no, we've covered that before. Yep, so we're still growing in the season of Easter. And we are going to hear another story today that is still about the day that Jesus was raised from the dead and showed up to his disciples. If Jesus walked down this aisle right now, what would your face look like? <laughs> would you know that it was Jesus? No. How would you know? Oh, these are such good questions. How would we know if it was Jesus walking down the aisle? We don't really know. We don't actually know what he looks like. We don't have a picture that we get to carry around. Well, we have some paintings. Some people have done some different pictures. But we don't really know exactly what Jesus looks like. We don't really know. Do you think um, if he showed us his hands, we would notice anything? Oh, probably not, maybe. Would he have some scars, maybe? Uh-huh, okay. So I want you to think about this because today's story, Jesus is going to show up and the people that he's going to show up to are startled and terrified. I want to see your best startled and terrified faces. <laughs> Lucas is falling asleep, everybody. That is not startled and terrified, Lucas. That is not startled. You're playing dead. Okay, I see it. Now I get it. All right. So when you hear that story today, I want you to think about what it was like for them to be startled and terrified, and then listen to the story and see how Jesus shows them who he is, what Jesus says about who he is. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you that you've gathered us here today in this season of Easter, where we get to continue to celebrate that Jesus is alive, that we get to continue to think about what it means to talk about who Jesus is, that we might know who Jesus is, that we might share about who Jesus is with others. God, thank you for your love for us and for all people. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may go back to your seats or to Little Lamb. Our first reading today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 12 through 19. <clears throat> when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob and the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so your sins may be wiped out. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Our second reading should sound familiar because I've already read part of it. Uh, it comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. <clears throat> See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are, chi we are God's children now. What we, will, what we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. On the first two Sundays in the season of Easter, we heard from the Gospel of John's accounts of resurrection. And this morning, we turn to the Gospel of Luke. In Luke's telling, the whole of chapter 24 is a single day, a day that moves from resurrection all the way to ascension. While likely more of a narrative strategy than some sort of factual timeline, since Luke, of course, contradicts himself when he gets to act, um, the piling on of these profound resurrection stories from the women at the empty tomb to the men on the Emmaus Road who see Jesus in the breaking of the bread, to today's story, this piling on builds a case for the surprise and the hope of Jesus raised from the dead. So let's listen again to these words from the book that we love as we too imagine meeting Jesus alive again. Luke 24, beginning at verse 36. While the disciples and their companions were talking about this, that is, Jesus appearing to Simon and to the two on the Emmaus Road, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving, and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, 
that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. After college, I spent three years working for a campus ministry organization. And this organiza organization did a really great job with training its campus ministers, including an intensive six-week training for all incoming staff. At one point in that training, we had to write about an aspect of ministry that we hoped to grow in. Or maybe it was something that we were most anxious about. What I remember about the process was that we first wrote a paragraph. And then we had to distill that paragraph into a sentence, and then one word. Unlike the epiphany stars that we take home and post where only we can see them, we wrote our words on t-shirts that we were forced to wear for several days of training. My word was evangelism. Now, despite plenty of training and reading, now two seminary degrees, and nearly 15 years of serving as a pastor, I still wrestle with the word evangelism. Not because I don't think that people need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ from me or from anyone else, but because of all the ways that I have seen and experienced evangelism gone wrong. I've never really been comfortable with the process of handing out a tract or going door to door to ask the question, if you died tonight, do you know where you would go? I also know way too many stories of cross-cultural evangelism, ignoring real human needs and misplacing Jesus along the way. I believe that the good news of Jesus Christ is best heard in relationship, an extended conversation, through an understanding of life experiences and the role that culture plays in our ability to receive the good news. I also strongly believe that the good news of Jesus Christ is meant to transform the right now, every day part of our lives, not just some future heaven or hell decision. I believe that our God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, is the very one who raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That this Jesus is the Messiah, the author of life, the holy and righteous one. And that this Jesus was resurrected to life, life in this world, life among real people who experience joy, disbelief, and wonder, and sometimes all at the very same time. The true meaning of the word evangelism is simply good news. Evangelism comes directly from the Greek word used throughout the New Testament for the good news of Jesus Christ. This is the same good news that Jesus himself proclaimed before and after his death to his disciples. This is the good news that Jesus lays out for them again using the scriptures, the prophets, the law, and the psalms. This is the good news to which all disciples then and now are called to witness. Today's story from the Gospel of Luke reveals good news to us. It is good news that Jesus meets us in moments of fear and confusion. It is good news that Jesus appeared alive to all of these different disciples in a scarred body, a wounded yet living body that breathed and knew hunger. It is good news that Jesus is willing to teach these disciples yet again, rooting them in beloved words and stories from Scripture. After all, we don't always get it the first time we hear it. 
And if we're honest, we don't always get it the seventh time we've heard it. So it's really good news that this resurrection story didn't stay a sworn secret amongst these disciples, but they bore witness. They bore witness in their joy of another too good to be true story. Remember when Abraham and Sarah in their old age had Isaac? Remember when stuttering Moses delivered God's people from Pharaoh? Remember when David, the least, the last, the unlikely brother, became Israel's greatest king? Remember when Jesus died and was raised again? They bore witness even in their disbelief. They told and retold the stories of their encounters with Jesus, puzzling through the words that he taught them, the deeds of power they saw. They studied the scriptures Jesus quoted and interpreted to them, and they told those stories too. And in their wrestling, they didn't let their desire to master the knowledge keep them from their own or others' encounter with the holy, with the hope and the promise of forgiveness, with the power of transformation. They bore witness in their wonder, pointing out the ways Jesus transformed their relationships with family, with neighbors and friends. They marveled at how acts of service and love could change a community from the inside out, meeting needs and sharing abundance. They delighted in feasting together and proclaiming the resurrection of Christ again and again. They bore witness. And on this side of the resurrection, we are also called to bear witness. And if we're honest, I'm not sure how many of us want witness on the front of our t-shirts as we're walking around. It might make us a little uncomfortable. We don't want to be asked to share our faith with someone else, at least not in words. We're happier thinking that faith, our own faith, is personal, it's private. We're happier letting it be someone else's responsibility to talk about the good news of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's why you have a pastor and elders and deacons and missionaries, right? Wrong? (laughs) Scripture makes it clear that every one of us is called to be a witness. We're called to witness to what God has done and to what God continues to do in this world. It's not meant to be complex. It does not require a special degree. It doesn't even ask you to be someone that you're not. Bearing witness is nothing more than saying where you think God is at work in your life and the world. We bear witness all the time. We're just not used to thinking about doing it in terms of our faith. If you read a good book or you see a good movie, what do you usually do? You tell someone about it. If you eat at a restaurant and get great service, awesome food, do you pretend like it never happened? No, you usually tell someone about it. You might even post a Google review or share about it on social media. If you buy a new device or try a new app that revolutionizes your technological life, you don't tend to keep it to yourself. You tell someone about it. When you like something, when you have a good experience with something, the moment you tell someone else about it, you become a witness. You're a good witness when you speak honestly, simply, conversationally. You might not use complete sentences. You might not have perfect grammar. You might mispronounce the product name or the menu item. But you're talking about something that you like. You're talking about something good that happened. It's a witness when we share about beautiful Lake Michigan sunsets or amazing views on a recent hike. We're witnesses when we share our relief over the end of the sickness of a loved one or the promise of a job for a high school or college graduate. 
Friends, we know, we know how to be witnesses in this life. Being a witness to the good news of Jesus Christ in our lives is no different than any of these things. It's not a matter of shoving what we believe in someone's face. It's about talking from our heart about something we've experienced, something that has transformed our lives, something that gets us out of bed every morning. There are lots of moments each day where God is at work in our lives, whether we're at home or school or work. To be a witness is to notice those small moments and then to share them with someone else and to give credit for the blessings, big and small, in our lives where that credit belongs. To me, one of the very best parts of being a witness is that it's not about being perfect. It's not about getting it exactly right. It's not about having it all figured out with all answers and no questions. It's about opening our mouths, about sharing the hope that we have, about this kind of turnaround that life in Christ affords us, about the power of forgiveness, about the reality of a God who conquered sin and death for us through Jesus Christ. And just like those disciples, we may have joy, disbelief, and wonder pulsing through our veins. And just like the disciples, we are witnesses of the good news. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. So open your eyes. See God at work in your life in the world around you. Study the scriptures. Poke them. <laughs> Ask God to open them to you. Worship the Savior of the world and discover forgiveness. Discover new life. For all that you experience that is good, that gives you hope, that brings you peace, that transforms you, Tell someone about it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Now we come to the table, to this feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. It is at this table that we sustain ourselves to be able to witness to the world of what we have seen, of what we have experienced. As I've said before, oftentimes my first thought of something goes to a song lyric. So as Miriam preached this morning, I couldn't help but think of a song whose title I cannot remember um, by the artist Derek Webb. But in the chorus, or somewhere in it, he says, May the bread on your tongue leave a trail of crumbs to lead the hungry back to the place that they are from. May the bread on your tongue leave a trail of crumbs to lead the hungry back to the place that they are from. And so as we come to this table and we, t and we go out into the world, may we, whatever we experience here, witness through a trail of crumbs that leads people back to this place, to the table, to the place that Christ is the one inviting us to the place where we find belonging, where we find hope, where we find sustenance to be a people of faith in a world that needs our witness. So friends, come to the feast this morning Come and eat with Christ our Savior. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy and right it is, and our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places, O Lord, our Creator, almighty and everlasting God. You created heaven with all its hosts and the earth with all its plenty. You have given us life and being, and preserve us by your providence. But you have shown us the fullness of your love in sending into the world your Son, Jesus Christ, the eternal word made flesh for us and for our salvation. For the precious gift of this mighty Savior, who has reconciled us to you, we praise and bless you, O Lord. With the whole church and the, on earth and the whole company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name. Holy, holy, holy Lord. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full. Righteous God, we remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in the expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. Together we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that this bread which we break and this cup which we bless may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Grant that, being joined together in him, we may attain to the unity of the faith and grow up in all things into Christ our Lord. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that the whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Every time you eat this, do so in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after they'd eaten, he took the cup and pouring it out, he said, This cup is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. The bread which we break and the cup which we bless are the communion of the body and blood of Christ. And these are the, the gifts of God given for us, the people of God. In a moment, we'll invite you to come down the center aisle. We'll be handed a piece of bread and you can take a cup from one of the elders on either side and return to your seats. If it is easier and more comfortable for you to be served in your seat, please know an elder is available for that. 
call the elders forward at this point. Come, for all things are now ready.
When I say, in the name of, our, of Christ, our risen Lord, I invite you to respond with, hear our prayer. Let us pray. God, our maker, source of Easter power and hope, you have walked with your faithful people through many generations, people facing challenges and uncertain times, people seeking your purpose and promise. We still face challenge, challenges and uncertainty, even with Easter in our hearts. Walk with us and with those for whom we pray for this day, so that in your, your resurrecting power may lead us into lives of faithfulness. In the name of Christ, our risen Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for children and young people who must think about the future in uncertain times, facing threats old and new. Give them hope rooted in the knowledge that their lives matter to you. Show them how to make a difference in this world whatever threats they face as they grow. In the name of Christ, our risen Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for people for whom age or experience, illness or disability, create barriers to full participation in your world. Surround each one in pain or despair with your comfort and renew in each one a sense of dignity and purpose. Show them how much they matter to you and to us. In the name of Christ, our risen Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for all those facing grief and any kind of loss. Give them strength and comfort. We pray for communities challenged by forces beyond their control, natural disaster and environmental threats, conflict and violence, economic hardship. Give courage to those facing these challenges and wisdom to those who lead, so that well-being may be restored and hope for the future prevail. In the name of Christ, our risen Lord, hear our prayer. As signs of spring emerge, we pray for your creation, for creatures losing habitat and unique species at risk, for oceans clogged with plastic and pollution in the air and water. Jesus, you are the firstborn of all creation. Help us to honor you by caring for the earth and its fragile balances in the ways in which we live and the priorities which we set. In these ways, too, we would be your disciples, and so we would pray the words you taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, our Glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, again, good morning and welcome to worship here at Second Church on this beautiful spring day. A few announcements about our life together as God's people here. Um, Sign-ups next week is our final picture directory Sunday, so please, if you haven't signed up for that or um, before or after the service, we'd love to get all of those set. These, uh, we have two more weeks of regular second hour programming this week. Sherry Osting is hosting the adults and high schoolers to talk about vocational discernment. And she assures us that you are never too young or too old to discern what's next. Um, so, and then Alberto, doc, excuse me, Dr. Alberto La Rosa will be leading next week talking about social justice in the reform tradition. So two members of our body with uh, much wisdom and much to share for all of us, so we certainly encourage you to come to that. Uh, middle school and children in worship are as usual. On the 28th, we're having an intergenerational second hour, um, which we have planned and are very excited about. And again, this is intergen is everyone. I know some of you are like, no, I'm too old to learn anything. No, you're not. So you should join us. Um, this is a uh, mobile food pantry week on Tuesday. Uh, more info about that is in the Spire. It's our final Wednesdays at 2nd. Uh, this week with hot dogs and hamburgers on the menu. On the 24th, we're having a skating party at Roll Escape with Faith and First. You are also not too old to roller skate. They have the things that can help you along. <laughs> so um, you certainly will want to sign up for that. Uh, please come back today at 3 p.m. Our second series features the West Michigan Children's Choir which will feature both the musical talents of Aaron and Kristen Goodike and the vocal talents of the Barnes Girls. 
Um, so we certainly encourage you to come back for that. And the ninth announcement on this list is, and I quote, I'm leaving this afternoon for a trip with RCA Global Mission. And that's all it says. Um, so, no, I covet your prayers. I leave this afternoon for a trip with RCA Global Mission to Europe. We'll be visiting uh, with a variety of missionaries and learning about the work that they do and what they might teach us about being the church here in West Michigan. And finally, I would like to invite our intern, AJ Funk, forward. Today is AJ's last Sunday with us, and we are great as an intern. Sorry, oh, yes, sorry. Last Sunday with us as an intern. That's true, you are a member here. Um, so, but we are grateful for your work uh, and life among us. And so this is a token of our gratitude, a, work, uh, a book that was very formational for Miriam and myself. So thank you, AJ, for your <laughs> God is a God of abundance and out of that abundance gives to us. And so we offer back our tithes and offerings as a token of our appreciation. our maker, you have filled the world with so much abundance. We offer our gifts to you, knowing they are a part of your abundance. Bless them and use them to bring hope and new life in Christ's name to meet a world in need. Amen. At this point, I'd like to invite our children and their leaders forward as we bless you on the way to children in worship. Congregation, what is our blessing? The Lord be with you.
joined in our sinning litany. At the table, we remember our good shepherd who laid down his life for us sheep. So we go into the world to share what we can with others. From the font, we know that we have been raised with Christ and made a new people. So we proclaim resurrection and hope. Rooted in the word, we see that Christ has burst forth from the tomb. So we demonstrate this new life in acts of love and healing. Transformed by the light, no darkness can overcome. We rejoice and carry peace for all. Now, friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said, amen. Go in peace.